Okay, folks, our guest speaker for this evening probably no, needs no introduction because he's been a regular speaker at our show, at our club for many years. He's known to the great majority of you as a um, highly respected aviculturist and exhibitor. Um, so again, I'd like to welcome Bob Barnes and thank you for taking the time and uh, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. Thank you. Uh, okay. I guess uh, Ivan and Matty have been chasing me for quite a few months now to, to come in and, and do a, another presentation. A few of you older hands will know I come here quite regularly. Uh, I've probably driven most of you to sleep over the over the years. Uh, I decided to have a shave for Joe so that he, he thought it was a new lecturer come on instead of my beard. To, uh, I said to uh, to Ivan, what what did he want me to talk about? Because over the years, I guess I've uh, I've I've talked on a lot of subjects, nearly always finch related. Uh, I also do some canary lectures from time to time for the Abbey guys and stuff. Uh, but finches are my true love, I guess. So I, I thought what I would do is think about the things I talked about over the years. So. Uh, one of the funny things is the first lecture I ever give was at the uh, Australian Abbey Society at, at David Holmes, which many of you would know, probably one of the best bird guides in my lifetime. Uh, him and I had similar thoughts on, on birds. And, and when I was 20 years old in the, uh, in the 70s, he invited me down to Melbourne to, to give a chat to... Uh, like 500 people or 600 people at the uh, the Abbey Society. So it was, that was my introduction to it. And as a subject, uh, David thought the things we should talk about is the birds we were losing in aviculture. So this sort of goes back into the 70s, this, this uh, presentation. So back in the 70s, we had uh, a lot more birds than we have today. Some of, of some of the losses have been uh, really tragic because there was no reason to lose them. Just uh, stupidity or lack of uh, understanding on our part or whatever. And we'll talk about that perhaps, you know, as we go on. Anyway, the, I, I started off by putting in uh, three of the soft bills, well, two soft bills and a half soft bill on my first slide. I kept and I bred the shammers, the bird in the middle. Not a difficult bird to breed, and and thankfully there uh, there's some becoming available again in Australia. Uh, if you've got big pockets, um, I think they're up in the uh, five eight thousand dollar a pair range. Uh, the silvery messiah is a uh, is related to the Pekin robin. Uh, these were lost to us in the 90s because a, a single guy uh, with lots of money decided he was going to save them. And we didn't learn until later. He had no idea what, what a stop bill was. So he was feeding them on bird seed. So, so he, lo he lost the last four pairs, I think. Uh, and my favorite bird, I guess, is the red crested cardinal. There was many of us used to breed them in the old days many members of this club, so uh, uh, Jack Stunnell, George Eldred, all sort of blokes like that. We'd probably put 20 or 30 birds a year on the, you know, we would breed between us. Not too difficult to breed as long as you fed them plenty of live food. Uh, this was in the days when uh, crickets and mealworms weren't the norm. So we used to go out with nets and catch grasshoppers and the like. But then we learned to breed grasshoppers. So we bred grasshoppers much the same as uh, people breed crickets now. Uh, Jack Stunnell stole a few breeding pairs from uh, Macquarie University. Uh, and we went on from there and, and bred many of these guys. Uh, I'll come back to why we lost them over time. All those fowls go to the directions. These birds were seven, in the 1970s were common. So this first bird is called a bronze wing mannequin. Uh, some of you may remember them. They were the commonest foreign finch we had. 
you you struggle to give this bird away. Uh, I remember taking 30 birds to a guy called Eric Schultz, who used to have a dealership over at Cronella, sort of way. Uh, and I think he gave me a strawberry cockbird or something from all. Right? Uh, so this little bird used to, a uh, little bit aggressive, but would breed really easy. Uh, unfortunately for it, a, a bird called the Rufus back mannequin appeared on the scene and everybody changed from bronze wing mannequins to Rufus back mannequins. Uh, the last one of these I saw, believe it or not, was outside Andrew's old store at, uh, at Fairfield. Uh, and, and a guy had one in a cage. I don't know why he didn't go in and sell it to Andrew, but uh, lots of reasons you don't sell to Andrew, really. But uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's uh, I saw one and I said, if you've got another couple like that, I'll, I'll take them, you know, but he didn't. Uh, the next bird, bird looks like a St. Helena, is, a, uh, uh, is called a black rumped waxbill these days. It used to be called a Senegal waxbill. It's half the size of a St. Helena. Uh, always used to breed on the ground, prolific breeders. Uh, we used to feed them, feed them on fruit flies. So again, Jack Stunnell had managed to find a source of uh, Drosophila that didn't fly at the, at the university. So we used to breed those up in little jars by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and they bred quite well. Little gray bird on the end, another nondescript bird. It's called the gray singing finch. Uh, probably the best of the singing finches that we've had. Because it was gray, it just didn't have any popularity. So it, it died off. Uh, oh, sorry. The guy down the bottom here is an Aberdeen. So, Back in the 70s, they were quite common. People chose to get rid of them because they're, they're quite a dirty bird. So they could only raise one nest and then you'd have to clean out the box and everything else because they were so poor on hygiene. So they nearly uh, disappeared altogether. There's a few guys now that have managed to, to bring them back from the brink, I think, and hopefully they'll go well. Uh, the bird in the middle here is a, a Madagascan weaver. In the 70s, well, in the early 70s, they didn't exist. A few turned up at uh, Taronga Zoo and the keeper at the, the main curator at the time was uh, uh, Graham Phipps. Uh, and Graham gave Jack Stunnell and I a couple of pairs of these uh, and we couldn't stop them breeding. They just, they went for rest. Uh, Russell Kingston then got them and he had uh, an aviary with maybe a hundred Colored birds in the aviary. It was a magnificent thing. People say they're around still. Uh, the birds I see frequently are uh, uh, hybrids for, for between a Madagascan and a Camaro. Some of them do have the red right through, which is supposedly the indicator. Uh, but the bird is is very small. It's smaller than a Napoleon weaver. So when you see these little guys in the flesh, they're a spectacular little bird. The little bird and there's a terrible shot on the end, the green bird, there's a green strawberry. These were bred in big numbers, particularly up in uh, Cessnock in the coal fields. Uh, they weren't really popular with the dealers because as soon as you put them in a cage, they would pluck each other. They, just uh, something they did when they were in close confinement, they, they plucked. Uh, but they weren't particularly hard to breed, uh, particularly if you were feeding white out and stuff. Uh, I think probably the last of them disappeared a few years ago. Uh, so th this is going to all be a bit negative until I get towards the end. Right? Uh, these aren't pictures of my cardinals, but I had the most of these cardinals. So I had the yellow bill cardinal, the top one. I had the uh, the Pope cardinal, which is very similar, but the bottom bird. The red crested cardinal, which is the the one I've liked the most, and we used to breed a lot of. The green cardinal, the last of which is stuffed in my uh, cupboard at home. Uh, and the second last one of which is in Stan Guest's fridge, I think, still. Uh, I managed to breed, breed three hens of, from this pair, but uh, you can't do much with three hens. And there was no cocks left. The red cardinal had various names here, but Virginia cardinal is probably the commonest. 
only ever existed in very small numbers. You know, people would have a pair or odd birds and things, but never big numbers. But there was no reason to lose the three red-headed cardinals. You know, they were uh, they were here in sufficient numbers. We should have saved them. Uh, rumors are that they were exported, but I don't I don't know why you would bother exporting them. But uh, a bird that Dave Holmes, or birds that Dave Holmes and I specialized in were the weavers and widers and widow birds. Uh, so there used to be at least tens of different varieties of weavers and widers. Some of which, so the red shouldered wider, the guy in the middle here, uh, I think the last one only died quite recently, the guy up in Newcastle. Uh, they're non parasitic, so they raise their own young ones. Uh, the red collared wider, I had the last pair of those and they bred, but I didn't have any other birds to put them with. Uh, the golden shouldered wider or yellow wider, or sometimes it's called the feather tailed wider. Uh, again, it raised its own. It used to be a guy in the foot of the Blue Mountains. They used to breed big quantities of these, but uh, uh, they never seemed to make it into circulation. The Paradise Wider, this guy, there was a, a trio of them ended up in Perth Zoo, uh, where they actually, because they're a parasitic wider, so they, they like a cuckoo, they nest in the, lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. So they're supposed to be parasitic on violet eared wax bills, which doesn't help us very much in Australia. Uh, but the guy, a guy called Neil Hamilton, who's lectured here, I think, Neil, uh, he, he managed to breed them using uh, auroras as the, the foster. But again, there was nowhere to go with them afterwards. Uh, the orange bishop weaver this is a broad tail paradise wider, so they only ever existed in odd pairs. And this is the Madagascan again. This is the Americans we've had and nearly lost. So this bird went under various names. Some, some people called it the house finch. It was also called a purple finch. Uh, according to the magazines, they're two different species, but the same bird would travel around getting called uh, by various titles. They bred reasonably well, very insectivorous, but they bred reasonably well. Uh, not a particularly attractive bird, so the, the bird is brown all the way down the back, so it's not it's not something that jumps at you. Uh, this is an American goldfinch in the middle. So over the years, these things occasionally cropped up. Uh, people had a lot of trouble getting them going. I don't know why, I never kept them myself, but uh, uh, you know, they were an attractive bird that whistles very well. The two bluebirds on the bottom here are a couple of the buntings we've had over the years. So this is the indigo bunting. Uh, and this is the lazuli or lazuli bunting. Uh, the issue they have with these birds, or we think we had with these birds, is that they migrate. Uh, so they seem to be so confused at the end of the breeding season in aviaries that... Uh, they seem to want to take the Avery down the road somewhere or, or, or do something because uh, they weren't happy being where they were. Uh, it, Dave had some limited success with them uh, and so did uh, Les Milton up in up in the valley, but nobody else seemed to do much good. This guy, we're, uh, we've, we've got a lot of, uh, putting a lot of hope into this one. So uh, there's members here that have got this bird. It's a red crested finch. It's sort of the cross between soft bills and hard, hard bills, so seed eaters and insect eaters. I'm told uh, from a taxon, whatever that word is, uh, taxus viewpoint, it doesn't have a, a gizzard like a, an ordinary finch. Uh, I've always treated mine exactly like finch, like a finch. They eat an extraordinary amount of live food, uh, quite a good songbird. To have a reputation of being savage, I've never found it, and I've, I've kept them for uh, maybe 20 years or more. Uh, and they're a cup nester. So all of these are cup nesters, by the way. I'm failing badly. No. All right, so these are the wax bills. We've, uh, well, not lost them all. The first bird at the top here was 
never common, but there was a, a fair few of them around. It's a blue-breasted waxbill. Uh, the guys in Adelaide in West Australia used to breed them in big numbers. And they would come over to Sydney, and because of the humidity, we think, uh, we used to drop the hens. Uh, so the people, less scrupulous guys, would breed them with blue caps or cordon hens. Uh, so in a pretty short time, uh, even when you did breed a blue-breasted blue waxbill, you'd end up one with cheek patches and, and whatever. And it became long because this is quite a stumpy bird. So uh, any uh, genetic purity was gone. For many years, people would breed cordons and occasionally throw a blue-breasted waxbill, you know, so it didn't have a cheek patch. So you'd get a cock bird that was just uh, didn't show the patch. Green strawberry we've talked about. The orange cheek, which is one of the success successes. Back in the 70s, uh, uh, I can't think of the dealer that used to be out at Bankstown Airport. He'll come to me. Uh, but he was the only guy I knew that had them. Uh, and we got a few pairs, and you'd breed one and lose one and everything else. But in, in recent years, a few of the Melbourne guys have uh, got them going. And then the Queensland has got them going. So you can now buy these. And I think they're probably, uh, don't know, I'm guessing the price, maybe $800 a pair or something. Andrew, no, cheaper. Buy off Andrew. Andrew's doing them cheaper. Uh, they're a really nice little bird in the neighbor. They don't look spectacular in the photo, but they're quite good. The lavender wax bill, again, it was, uh, they'd sort of come in patches. So all of a sudden, there'd be a few of them available. Uh, I, I managed to get a few off uh, out of the Adelaide guys and I thought I'll pair them up with some I get out of uh, uh, Russell Kingston so I bought five five birds from each place and I thought they're easy to sex and, and then I realised there was two different species of them uh, so they're, they're very difficult to sex uh, but uh, I think what caused their demise is people trying to cross the subspecies together uh, this bird in the center here is probably the uh, a bird that would rival the the Goulian. so it's the violet eared waxbill. Uh, the, again, in Adelaide they seem to do reasonably well, and we'd bring them to Sydney and we'd try and try and try and we would lose one bird, and uh, months later you'd lose another bird. Uh, and then cleverer people than me worked out that it was the humidity on the East Coast that was killing them. We just couldn't keep uh, this guy and the uh, grenadier wax bill alive this side of the mountains. Uh, so th these guys managed to linger on for a fair while in West Australia and South Australia. Uh, th there's rumours they still exist in Queensland, so hopefully they do because they're a lovely bird. This is the Senegal wax bill again, which is... Uh, like I say, a small St. Lena. Okay, these are the ones that are hanging on. Maybe they're hanging on. So the Shama, uh, you know, again, people in this club have these. Uh, the Madagascan Weaver, I've got me doubts, but I'm hoping it's hanging on because I'm trying to get some. Uh, the Magpie Robin, which was... Uh, uh, I bred for many years and uh, foolishly got rid of them and now struggle to get them back again. This is the Grenadier Waxbill, which is, uh, again, some people are breeding them in quite big numbers. The Red Crested Finch, which I don't know how many pairs, maybe there's a dozen pairs going around, I don't know, hopefully more. And my favourite bird, I guess, the Pekin Robin, which uh, my claim to fame is I lost more hens than anybody else, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I probably had the nucleus to save this bird and because of rats I lost all the hens in, in one night so that was uh, the most depressing time of my bird keeping life I think uh, there are some around and hopefully they'll get going but I I really I don't feel confident about it happening alright the success stories I guess uh, this is a Napoleon weaver. So during the 90s and even into the 2000s, this bird was selling for maybe 2,000, 
2500 $3,000 a pair. And those that had them, so basically it was a guy in Melbourne called Mandry, Peter Mandry. All of a sudden his birds wouldn't breed anymore. And the others that were around were at similar faults. Uh, and I managed to find a cockbird uh, from a, a father of one of the members of this club. Uh, and I lent it to the guys in Tasmania and they bred 17 off it in the first season, right? So that cockbird saved Napoleons and now you can buy these things for a couple hundred dollars, I guess. Uh, so they're fairly safe, right? They're, they're pretty good. The uh, Aberdeen or red-headed finch, I don't know if it's safe because a, a lot of them I see are still hybrid, but there's a there are pure too. I think it's pretty good. There's one guy in particular doing quite well with them. Orange cheeks we talked about, which are doing well. Blue caps have had a real resurgence, so there seems to be plenty of those around. And the pinto wider, uh, I guess, thanks to Dave Holmes in the first part, but lots of guys now are, are breeding these in, in, in quite good numbers. It's a parasitic wider, so it uh, doesn't raise its own. It uses St. Linus to, uh, to, to uh, raise its young. Uh, but some of the guys are, are producing good numbers. Uh, I guess if I'm asked to, to do predictions, what do I think for the next few years? Even those that I th are saying are successes are, are, are hanging on. Uh, I think the nuns in general are going to fall over. The, I see them for sale occasionally and they're not pure. Uh, the ones that look pure look like they're as old as I am. Uh, saffrons, and I don't even know if this is the saffron we have or not. I don't think it is. But uh, they all come from one guy down in Wollongong. And I know, uh, you know, some of the guys that have got young off him are they're thrilled with the success. But it comes out of four birds. So, uh, one lot of four birds were sold to this guy in Wollongong. He bred up quite a lot of young ones, but they're all very, very closely related. So uh, it works on some species that closely related will go on forever. So that they call them the island species. So some of the parrot finches can be inbred quite uh, dramatically because they're, they're used to that uh, not being able to find any outsource. But something that comes from a, a significant continent, like uh, South America, uh, doesn't have that luxury. So I think if, if it's all based on four or five birds, this is one to watch. Uh, there's things like Himalayan green finches, which some guys are doing really well with them. Some guys are doing really well with a bird they think is a Himalayan green finch, and it's not. Uh, and, and that's the same for the, the Madagascan. Some people are breeding them really well, but they're not Madagascan weavers. Uh, so it, it's important that we uh, perhaps think about where we're going to go. As I say, in 1974 or 75, I did this present, well, not this presentation, a presentation saying we need to uh, control our own destiny. Uh, and here I am 50 years later. <laughs> Saying we've uh, we dropped the ball for the last fifty years on most of them, we we still have an opportunity to save them. You know, and, and it doesn't mean they're extinct in the wild or anything else, right? This is we're talking Australia uh, for these birds. If Sam and the canary and cage bird guys are successful, maybe one day you'll import them. I'm old and I'm cynical. You know, I've been waiting for that to happen for fifty years. Uh, birds do mysteriously reappear uh, but you, you need to be aware of the fact that uh, even when they reappear it, it's not a hundred birds that are reappearing it's a handful of birds and they're related to one another right so uh, if you're going to get them to, to, to be here for your kids and, and whatever you need to work together right so those of you that have got endangered birds uh, just, just be mindful. If, if you're breeding a pair of Aberdeens, you probably don't have 10 pairs of them. So when you do breed them and you sell a pair, that pair is related one to the other. And you're going to sell it to some guy who's uh, now thinks he's going to save the Aberdeens from extinction, right? It's, uh, 
I never go into a bird species unless I can buy two or three birds. And I like to buy them from more than one source to, to get the best opportunity. I've been speaking to a few guys here for years, actually, that we, we need to get a program set up where you, you know, it's not the enemy of the other guy breeding the birds. You know, he's, he's the guy that's going to keep you going for another 20 years and you keep him going and we keep the, the species going. The Siskin guys are a great example. They've Red Siskins were, it's not on my list of things, but they were uh, quite rare at one stage. And now they're, if you, if you, if you follow the Queensland or the National Finch Survey, it's one of our commoner finches, believe it or not. A, a lot of people keep red siskins, right? Uh, and that's done because we 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 work together a bit, right? And we need to work together for all of these and for everything else. You know, if, if you if you're like me and you have multiple ivories, put one of them aside for for black-headed nuns or for white-headed nuns or for something. It, not so many years ago, this uh, this club did a uh, uh, a red strawberry and silver bill initiative where they handed out silver bills to everybody to to breed and uh, and give red red strawberries to some others to breed breed the numbers up and I think red strawberries are now you know very healthy populations but silver bills I got no idea I think they're just on the way out again they're the famous little brown jobs you know that Nobody really likes them because they're just little brown brown birds. Uh, but but if we always do that and we we knock back the nuns and we knock back the cutthroats and we knock back the javas and we knock back the silverbills, uh, soon you don't have anything left, right? You, you know, and this is uh, we're now looking at Sam's party trip of uh, I'm still alive and growing well. Right. Uh, if if I could talk talk about just some of the reasons we we did lose them. So in in a lot of cases it was just insufficient birds, right? So we, the gene pool was never strong. So with my green cardinals, it took me five years to get the the mate for the cockbird I had. The the guy that had the hen was neither willing for me to give him the cock or for him to give me the hen, and we fought for years and years and years and years. And I gave him peaking rubs to get a, a, a very old kind of uh, But then I bred it, but I had nowhere for the, the progeny to go. Uh, many of the things we talked about are parasitic. So if you, you know, you're not going to breed violet ear wax birds so you can raise, you know, some of the exotic whiters. Uh, the violet ear wax birds worth 8,000 bucks. So why would you, why would you use them as a, a parent? There was a lot of difficulty recognizing the difference between subspecies, as I said, with the lavenders. Dave and I also, uh, he would work the the south coast and west of Australia and things, Adelaide, and I would do New South Wales, the gold fields up into Queensland. And whenever we saw a weaver in any dealers, we would just buy it, no matter what it was. Uh, and Russell Kingston was a great uh, aid in those times he'd phone us up and tell us he had five birds that weren't sparrows and he figured they were probably weavers right so we just buy them so if you get a crimson crown weaver hen and a grenadier weaver hen they're almost identical right they're they're a subspecies of one another uh, they didn't appear to, to cross and that was the way we sort of sorted them if the if the grenadier weaver didn't like the hen then we took it that it was probably a crimson crown weaver hen uh, we had weavers from Asia, so we had Taya weavers from Asia, which anybody who's travelled through Asia will see the nest with the long tubular uh, nest. Uh, it's got a similar name and a similar appearance to a Bayer weaver, which is from Africa, right? And the hands look almost identical. So people would sell you birds that not trying to cheat you, but they just they didn't know any better. Uh, Nibris, or for anybody who knows, we the first of the licensing schemes came out, and anybody with exotic birds needed to register what they had, uh, so Big Brother could keep an eye on it to stop smuggling. Apparently, uh, scared the crap out of a lot of people, so a lot of people uh, jettisoned the birds that were going to be on that list. Uh, 
that's where the rumors I think of birds being exported and things come from. Uh, but effectively what it meant is the, the coal fields guys and all those sort of blokes, uh, they were all blokes at the time, probably my age now, but uh, when, when I used to talk to them, they just didn't want the paperwork and the hassle. So they got rid of the lavenders and the violet ears and the grenadiers and, and the green strawberries and everything else. Uh, also, you, you'd get new birds. So, that, and and again, pintail parrot finches is a bird that uh, we believe is available again in Australia, in, in very very small quantities and very expensive. When they've come here in the past, which uh, uh, the trouble was trying to keep them alive was to work out what their diet was. So we we fed them on raw rice, cooked rice, you know, we fed them on everything. Then. If you kept them alive, that was the success. You know, doing anything else was was greater than that. There was also guys that got the royal parrot finch, which is a bright blue parrot finch. Uh, none of you would have seen one in Australia. Uh, you don't even see them overseas very often. Uh, but they eat dates, and they only eat dates at a particular stage <laughs> of a date's growth. So you can't just go to a greengrocer's and buy dates, right? So they weren't uh, particularly successful for us. Uh, the climatic requirement, as I said, we 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 found that uh, the, the birds from Central Africa, which when we started to look it up was quite a lot of them, just couldn't cope with the humidity in Australia. So they just, uh, oh, not in Australia, on the East Coast. The violet ears and grenadier waxbills and the like just didn't survive. And, and the biggest uh, downfall of all of these things is collectors. And it's always been about collectors, right? So it's the it's the people out there that decide that they're uh, they have sufficient funds that they'll buy this thing and and be well known for the the last person on earth to have them. Uh, I never want to be the last person on earth to have them. I want to be the last person to breed them, maybe, but not the last person to have them. Uh, and unfortunately, we've lost so many birds to to. To, to these collectors over the years, you know, as I said, the silvery messias all bought by one guy in Melbourne and he lost them in a month. Uh, and he's not the only example, there's, there's a million of them out there. Uh, I'll just close on the last thing you, you need to look out for with the birds you have today. So the first thing that becomes obvious is when you start to throw a predominance of one sex, generally cockbirds, but not always. So if all of a sudden everybody's chasing uh, hens of a particular variety, it's be it's often because the gene pool is now shrinking big time. And the last thing you think of is to go out and find somebody from interstate or something to give you a cordon or a, a parrot finch or something. You, th you think I'll buy it from the guy next door, you know, or the guy down the street, or one of the guys in the club. Uh, it's the same guy you bought the bird from 10 years ago, you know, and uh, you need to be going further afield and finding some, uh, if that's the issue, if, if the genetics are being shot to pieces. Uh, I remember many, many years ago, we did it with Cubans, believe it or not. They were, weren't breeding, small nest sizes and, and old cockbirds. And we got a bunch of cock, a bunch of pairs sent up from Melbourne and it, and it rejuvenated them all again, right? Uh, very small nests are another example, or poor fertility. So if they're laying five eggs, but only two are fertile, uh, it's generally a sign they're on the way out. And lastly, it's the hybrids, I guess. it's It still happens today. I uh, Believe it or not, I can make it around Facebook a bit. Uh, and I watch these new guys on, on YouTube and things like that, and they've got lovely aviaries. And everybody's commented on it. And they've got blue faced paraffinches and red faced paraffinches and tricolor paraffinches all in the same aviary, right? And they say, well, they never cross. And I can tell you now, they always cross, right? It's not, do they? They always cross. So sooner or later, you're going to have hybrids, right? It's the same with the nuns. They have black headed nuns and white headed nuns and tricolor nuns. And we'll throw in some chestnuts and whatever else. They'll cross. You may not even notice it's a cross until two or three years down the track. And then you think you've bred a color mutation. It's not a mutation, it's just the hybrid coming through, right? So 
just things to be mindful of. It, it's not meant to be a doom and gloom thing. You know, I've been doing this uh, 60 years, I guess. Uh, and I've loved it all, all the way along. Uh, and I'd like to think, you know, I, I may not be doing it another 60, but I'll do it as long as I can. But other people will also be getting enjoyment, but we need to uh, be a little bit mindful instead of maybe just doing it on our own all the time. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for a very interesting talk. Uh, any questions for Bob? Brian? Uh, this would be an easy one for you. About, it might have been this time last year, I brought a chestnut in here that was had a black, you know, fully black chest. And I thought, I'm getting rid of that because it doesn't look like a chestnut. Um, would it have been a cross from one of those nuns that you're talking about? Or are you aware that there are sort of really dark chestnuts? Because never did find out the answer. And I don't know who took it home or where what happened to it, but if anyone knows, I'd love to know. I think it comes in, uh, there's three answers to that, I reckon. The, there is a dark morph of the uh, uh, chestnuts, so it does actually uh, come right through the white on the chest. Uh, there's a couple at uh, Renee's, where well, there was last week. I think they're, uh, what do you call it, when they just lack a light, like a calcium or whatever. Yeah, it's a melanistic. They've gone melanistic. And I think there's the occasional one that's got hybrid blood in it. So I think you've... Uh, uh, I, I I wouldn't want it any one of the three, to be honest. But uh, I, I understand, and I've seen people do it, where they have uh, they go out of the way to buy it to, to try and breed it true. Uh, as a kid, I went out and bought some uh, Java sparrows that have black cheek patches. And to get them, I had to pay a lot of money for them. Uh, in the first malt, they all had white cheek patches again. Uh, and then I went back to the block I bought them from, and all his birds had black cheeks. And I checked the seed he was feeding. And if you feed Javas on plain canary and not finch mix, the cheek patches will fill in, so you get black cheeks on a Java sparrow. So then, then take them to Andrew, because he'll pay you a lot of money for <laughs> uh, So th there's lots of birds you can uh, you can influence the the color and the and the and just by the conditions you you keep them under you know so uh, uh just a warning for any there's not too many youngsters here but maybe some newbies uh if the bird's the best colorful bird in the shop or in the block you're going to buy the birds off it's probably old right they get better as they get older so the the one just about to cark it is probably the best looking bird there uh because that's what they do. They, they improve in colour year on year. Uh, so if you can buy them, buy them three-quarter coloured or whatever. Uh, but if you're going to buy them, buy, buy a pair and then swap one of them with, with somebody else. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Anyone want to give away any more of Andrew's feeding secrets? <laughs> Yeah, always deal with Debbie. If you go to the shop, deal with Debbie. She's a lovely, lovely person. I've got a look. I don't know if it's a question, but an observation. When, when you were talking about both the the red siskins, the strawberries, and the um, silver bills as well, like our strawberry program, from our perspective here in the club, was pretty much a disaster. Yeah. But but it's interesting that I think we I think we kind of promoted the hell out of them by doing that. And it meant that they became a really popular finch again. A lot of people got them. And I think that's probably what happened with the red siskins too a little bit. We we, we kind of ran and raved about them for a couple of years, you know, and, and still do a little bit with the red siskin initiative. And suddenly people saw them as something, you know, so thought, oh, hang on, I might get some of them. So so maybe there's a lesson to learn there. Maybe we don't have to sort of do it ourselves at a club, but we could kind of, you know, choose some of those birds that are um, in danger and 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 just just promote them. We don't have to actually buy them and and try to you know breed them as a club. I mean, people will do that without us having to having to push it. Maybe if, if I could talk just on the red strawberry, I'm not going to keep you here forever. But the, 
there used to be two varieties of red strawberries in the country. One they called the Koshin red strawberry and the other one Bombay or something. Uh, one was bigger and duller and the other one was smaller and brighter. So the, the clever people, uh, which hopefully none of you are, right, decided that they would breed a big bright one. So they crossed the dull big one with the little bright one and ended up with a bunch of dull bigger birds. And for years, they lost popularity strawberries because they weren't that vibrant red. I don't know what's happened in recent years, but now there's some decent red birds around, right? For many, many years, I red strawberries were all a combination, you know, a hybrid or a, a, a cross of the two subspecies, you know? So they, they didn't attract anybody. They lost that, uh, that exciting red color about them, you know? And on that same level, there used to be two orange breasts. One was called an orange breast, and the other one was called a golden breast. One was big, one was small, and they crossed them, uh, and 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 really didn't end up with a better bird. The the green singing finch, which is a really common bird, quite common anyway. Uh, when I was young, you couldn't get them, couldn't get green singer anywhere because there was a big green singer. Uh, yeah, Mozambique singer, and. Uh, Everybody decided the little guy come along and we'll dump the big guys and cross them with the big guys and do everything else. So we ended up with these mongrel green singers, you know. It's cordon blues used to come as a ordinary cordon blue and an Angolan cordon blue. One was big, one was small. They crossed them together, right? So uh, the temptation's always there. If you've got a bird, uh, people with bloods have been doing it for 50 years. You, you buy a pair of bloods. And you drop the hand, so you buy the cheaper variety of blood and buy a hand. Right? So you breed white bellied bloods with black bellied bloods. You get a dirty colored uh, blood, and people think they've done well. You know, if you're going to breed bloods, breed whites to whites and blacks to blacks. Right? It's, uh, it's not rocket science, it's, it's just what you need to do. And, it, and if you can't find a mate, give it to somebody who's got one, you know, instead of letting it die in your ivory pass it on to somebody else who may be able to breathe with it. Anyway, I've kept you too long. Thank you. And before you go too far, Bob, just something to warm up the insides when you get home. So thank you very much for another terrific talk. Oh, I'll go, I'll just put it out somewhere. Oh, yeah, you don't want to wait, do you? Yeah. We don't care if they take